yeah, you know that lyric? That's some bad advice. <laughs> Y'all were singing it. <laughs> you were letting it wash over you, right? Not what was true and honorable and right and pure and lovely, whatever of good repute, if there's anything worthy of excellence or uh, uh, anything excellent or worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. That song, man, it just washes over you and you have to start to do this, don't you? <laughs> we're young. The, the Bible says, man, the glory of young man is their strength. In other words, you think you're never going to die, man. We're going to put the sun out. I'm going to be around for a long time. We are young and we can burn bright and we can burn long and we can burn forever. And there is nothing to do but to light it up. Get it while you can. This is your 20s, man. This is just the practice round. Let's go around a few times. Let's not miss out now. We'll have a chance to settle down later. Ever heard that advice? Ever thought it? Are you living it? A lot of you are. Our buddy JP, I know him well, right? This was his story. You know, he kind of grew up around church in a cultural way. But then he went to college and he drifted because when you're just around something kind of a cultural way, whatever culture you're around is going to jump on you. And it jumped all over JP, man. He was, he was being totally influenced by it. He was um, letting a lot of alcohol run through him and he was trying to run through everything he could put his hands on. And his life was a wreck. And after a week, man, he couldn't sleep. He was nervous. He was laying in bed. He picked up the phone. He called a friend. And he said, man, I am stressed out. I don't know what to do. I'm supposed to be having the time of my life. I'm doing all the things that people say will make you have the time of your life. What am I supposed to do? And the advice he got on the other end of that phone was this. Man, hey, that's what we do, bro. This is the years. You go get it while you can. Treat yourself. <laughs> right? This is the day to live it up. You can grow up later. Right? You'd be a lug. You'd be a lesbian until graduation. And then, then you can go find you a man and raise the house, get your little white picket fence. Ever heard that? It's worked its way into your vocabulary. And if there is any lie that is built into youth, it is I can get serious about my life later. Let me just tell you something. You ever heard the phrase, you've been around sports, you're going to play like you practice? I hear it all the time. You know, you know we're, we're going to, you end up playing like you practice. We've, we've talked about this. You know, some of the bad advice we've already discussed here, try it before you buy it. But what we don't know is when we experience intense pleasure, our body shoots off chemicals that literally hardwires our brain and all of our senses to be attached to certain behaviors. It identifies certain opportunities, certain experiences with intense pleasure, and our brain wants to run back to those things. We become hardwired because we are practicing this. We're practicing, practicing. This is what you do to find pleasure. And bro, you just can't just switch that off because you have ingrained in your mind that is the way to roll. When you start to say, get it while you can, get it now, treat yourself, you ain't treating yourself, you are training yourself. That song, man, we're gonna burn bright in the sun, we're never gonna have any bad times. That song in itself already exposes its own lie. You ever listen to all the lyrics? He's talking about the fact that some other dude there in sunglasses is trying to move in on you, and the reason you're away from me is because I left a scar on you that hurt you. I ain't made it right yet, but maybe you'll get drunk enough tonight, and maybe when you just want to fall down, I'll be there, and I'll carry you home. And then he wants to just sing that siren song one more time. I'll be that guy that'll help you get that life that you want. That song, that lie's been around for a long time. You scroll that back 30 years. And uh, there was a song when I was your age. It was the summer before I came to really understand what I want to talk to you about tonight, about where life can really be found. And it's a song called Only the Good Die Young, man. I'll play it for you in just a second. It's the idea that if you want to live a good life, if you don't want to get it while you can, if you don't want to treat yourself, if you want to be burdened by the religion and the laws of old, then you're going to die a young death. Over here, we're living it up. This is where the party is. This is where it's brighter than the sun. That lie's been around for a long time. Here's the way I heard it, okay, in the 70s. Check it out. All right, man, hey, I, I remember hearing that. I sung it. I sung it all summer long. 
I was convinced at that line, and Billy Joel writes in there, come on, Virginia, is the reason he chose that name. That little stained glass curtain you're hiding behind, all right? He said, you got to come out where the sun really shines, where the sun is. You're getting muted sunlight. You're being lied to. Come on, virgin, yeah. Get on out here where life is. That song's been around for a long time. You want to know how long? Not just 30 years ago, thousands of years. And if there is a loving father, he would do everything he could to put a new song in your heart. See, this is what happens when you really understand who God is and that he's not trying to rip you off, he's trying to set you free. It changes your tune, man. It changes the way you roll. And you're not going to go get you some. You're going to go get all you can of where real life resides. Can I just tell you something, man? Nobody looks at you and thinks you're a fool because you're being seduced by the things that you're being seduced by because that is the story of humankind, and it's especially the story of youth. If there's a, if there's a verse in my Bible that I have seen evidenced again and again in the lives of, my, in the lives of men and in my life, it's this. It's in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 11. It says this, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, therefore the hearts of men among them are given fully to do evil. In other words, you get away with something, you go, that, that didn't really hurt, or that wasn't too bad, or it hadn't stung enough yet, and so you just go back for more, and you think that, hey, I think I'm gonna be the one that gets away with this. I'm gonna be the one that does party now, and I will grow up later. This is just the practice round. Actually, it's not even the practice round. I'm not training for anything. This is recess. And it's time for me to play. I'll grow up later. But what you don't understand is that you are growing into something that you're not going to like. I love, you know, different signs that you see around uh, when you're driving, you know, I, I can remember my, my buddy and I were driving through Arkansas one time. We were just little, little town. It said, you know, uh, such and such Arkansas, home of Jim Bad News Brown, or Jim Bad News Barnes, rather. And we thought, that is hilarious. We have no idea who Jim Bad News was. We literally, in this little town of Arkansas, drove to what, what you would imagine is there, like this little, um, you know, like malt shop, barber shop kind of thing. We walked in, and we go, who's Jim Bad News Barnes? And they go, oh, you know what about bad news? And some Five old men in the corner started talking about Jim Bad News Barnes, how amazing he was. I go, was Jim Bad News still living? They go, no, but his mama does. So we went over to Jim Bad News Barnes' mama's house. It's the first time I ever had fried green tomatoes. We just knocked on the door, literally, just to make an experience. We knocked on the door. We go, we understand Jim Bad News Barnes used to live here. And she goes, yes, he did. And she opened the door, showed us all the pictures, all the newspapers she had cut out. He played in the NBA way back in the day before I even knew about it for the Celtics and and we sat down there, we had fried green tomatoes and laughed with this woman and just talked about how amazing. Now, she lives in a town that's well known because of her son who grew up there. I love street signs. I love, I love town signs. I, I always um, read them. I saw one, no kidding, one time it said this. It said, uh, it was a gas station. It said, uh, we sell Mexican food. We have gas on the exact same sign right there. I go, how obvious is that right there, okay? <laughs> There's a street sign I've never seen because I've never been to Alaska, but the street sign says this. When you leave certain parts of um, cities in Alaska, especially uh, as you move towards the, the colder months, which there's a lot of them up there if you haven't paid attention to your world geography, once cars start to travel, what they do is they, they make ruts. And from town to town, you literally get in a rut and you drive in that rut from one town to another until you get to a turnaround, you come back. And so this rut goes to this town, this rut goes to that town, and so there's all kinds of signs that says, choose your rut wisely. You'll be in it for the next 60 miles, the next 200 miles, the next 50 miles. Let me just tell you something. It's a lie that you can jump the rut. This treat yourself, this get it while you can, this is I'll grow up later. What you're doing is you're jumping in a rut, and some of you guys will sit there and you go, how did I get here? Why can't I turn this around? Now, I'm going to tell you tonight about a God who will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. And though your sins are red as scarlet, he'll make them white as snow. 
but you gotta start dealing with some of the lies that you've listened to. There's another verse in scripture that says this. It says that we should encourage each other day after day, as long as it's called today, so we won't be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Part of the deceitfulness of sin is that we think we're gonna be the one that plays with it and not get owned by it. We're gonna be the one that thinks we can beat it. We're gonna be the one that thinks that it's not gonna grab a hold of us and train us so we become somebody we never thought we'd be. I told you, these, this, 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 these songs have been around for a long time. Um, you guys uh, know who Homer is? Not, not, not Simpson, all right, all right? The one who wrote the Iliad, that book you didn't read in high school, remember that, or college? That Homer. Uh, he wrote uh, about Ulysses, or Odysseus, right? And, and, and even the ancient Greeks understood there are certain siren songs. Remember that little part of that mythological part of Odysseus' story where, where every man that sailed by this island where those three sisters were, whose song was so amazing and so sweet and so seductive that they couldn't help but navigate their sails and turn the rudder so that their ship would sail towards that beautiful song. And life after life was lost there because every ship was wrecked on the jagged reefs that were there in that bay where they thought they were sailing to life, but they knew they were sailing to death. Can I give you the antidote to the siren song of fun, of Billy Joel? You guys remember what Odysseus did? He wanted to hear the song, which was a bit foolish, but at least he had the sense to tie himself to the mast. He had all the other men on his ship put wax in their ears, to, to, to prohibit them from listening to this seductive song that ruins the lives of men. And he said to them, no matter what I say to you, you do not cut me off that pole. You strap me to the mast until we get past that harbor to the other side. Don't you listen. You better make sure that your mind is not perverted by what is not true, what is not honorable, what is not right, what is not pure, what is not lovely, what is not worthy of praise, that isn't excellent. You gotta put wax in your ears on that stuff or you're gonna keep sailing towards it. It's amazing, man. We know that song is the reason I kind of played that before we came out here. Those songs are seductive and we don't know it, but it's just moving us towards this idea that God's not good. If God was good, he'd let me run on over there to where all my friends are higher than the empire. And it's a lie. And I've lived long enough to see it. You guys know that a number of years ago, we started putting um, on the packages of cigarettes. We didn't used to do that. The tobacco industry had a major um, grip on our economy. And the lobbyists of the tobacco industry were, were major in forming um, the way Congress made laws. And eventually, when they showed the addictive power of nicotine, they, um, they started to, to put on cigarette packages warning labels that said, hey man, listen, this could cost you your health and maybe even your life. You remember that? You know, I, 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 most of us didn't grow up in a, in a smoking generation. I did. You know, my parents smoked uh, when I was young. Almost everybody did. In cars, unfiltered cigarettes. My grandfather, I hardly ever remember him without a cigarette in his mouth. But let me just tell you, man, the addictive nature of Tobacco is overwhelming, it's unbelievable, it ruins, and I'm looking for just pieces here to walk you through it. Person after person, there's not an aspect of your body, not a single organ that isn't affected by it. There are little hair-like creatures on your lungs that move like this, and the tar and the nicotine clogs them up, and it keeps um, the, 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 healthy, the, the healthy part of your lungs from trapping the, the poisons and the toxins that, that you're exposed to that, that ultimately, because it can't clean it, cancer sticks to your lungs. Still 90% of all cancer, lung cancer patients, it's still the number one cause of death in our country from cancer is lung cancer, and 90% of lung cancer patients are smokers. Here's a picture of a healthy lung right here. That the little black specks are just what happens when you live in the city. It's a, it's a lung, a healthy lung from a city. There's pollution that happens. This is the picture of a smoker's lung. Look at that. Now you look at that white part, you go, well, there's still some part that's not contaminated. That's cancer. That's what killed them. 
And you look at that, what's so amazing is people go, well, man, I don't inhale. Even if I inhale, I'm exhaling all of it. Do you know that when you take in a cigarette, when you exhale, 90% of the smoke that you inhaled, no matter how much you did, 90% of what you inhaled is not exhaled. It sticks in you. And it creates a corrosive element, not just to your lungs, but to every part of your body. And people go, I'll just smoke for a little bit, I'll get rid of it. And there's addictive nature to the behavior, just as addictive as heroin. And so eventually we just started to warn people, you best not mess with that, even if it makes you look cool when you're young. Probably not as many smokers here as there used to be. But those of you that smoke know about the addictive nature. And some of you guys go, who will smoke? That's just nasty. But you know, every generation's got its cigarettes, man. This generation's cigarettes is just, hey, same-sex experimentation. Just kind of everybody does it. I'll just jump off that little track later. Or who knows what it might be. But it's out there, and it's a lie. This song's been around a lot longer than Homer. About 400, 500 years before Homer, there was another little piece of uh, literature that was written. It's called Proverbs. Proverbs I love because it is... um, written to fools like me, and they're short, and they're easy to follow. Listen to Proverbs chapter one. Are you ready? The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to discern the sayings of understanding, to receive instruction in wise behavior, righteousness, justice, and equity. Man, that's good stuff right there. To give prudence to the naive, the impressionable, those who think they've got it all figured out, who don't need help from anybody. To the youth, knowledge and discretion. A wise man is gonna hear and increase in learning. And a man of understanding will acquire wisdom. That's the job of a young man or young woman, is to become wise. The word wise means skilled in living. If you're not skilled in living, you're in trouble. When you get around kids, kids don't know the difference between a rope and a snake, a curb and a cliff. And they need somebody to protect them. And I'm just telling you, when you're young, you think you've got it all figured out, that previous generations jacked with stuff, and maybe they got away with it, or it looks like they got away with it, but I'm going to get away with it. Now's recess. I'm not training for anything. I'm just having fun. It says, to understand a proverb and a figure, verse 6, the words of the wise and the riddles. I love that, the words of the wise and the riddles. I love riddles. And what it's saying is, sometimes... What it means to live a skilled life is like a riddle to some people. You don't understand it. And sometimes you hear uh, older people say things and you kind of cock your head like a dog who's hearing a strange noise. You can't really figure it out. Even in Proverbs, when you go and read, like in Proverbs chapter 14, it says that, um, it says, uh, where the oxen are, where, where there are no oxen, the manger is clean. But much increase comes by the strength of the ox. And you're kind of like, that sounds like something my dad would say and makes no sense to me. It's a riddle. And what it basically talks about is, hey, if you want a nice, clean, exact life with no trouble, no manure laying around, okay, then don't have any oxen. Be an inflexible person who likes everything in its perfect order and doesn't have your life interrupted. But here's the thing. Oxen produce a lot of good. But relationships are messy. Friendships are messy. Community is messy. And if you don't want any messes, then just go ahead and isolate yourself. But much increase comes from the strength of an ox. It's like a riddle. Don't you love riddles? I love riddles, right? I ask my kids all the time, hey, hey kids, you know, what happens when you throw a white hat into the Red Sea? And they go, I don't know. What happens? You all know? It gets wet. That's the answer, all right? (laughs) So you're too smart for yourself. You overthink, right? Uh, But I love riddles, like like this one. So, um, you know, I like to ask my kids, what's so delicate that even saying its name will break it? That's right, I heard it. Silence, silence. How about this one? Uh, What is something that you you throw away the outside, you cook the inside, then you eat the outside and throw away the inside? I'll give it to you again, you ready? I love riddles. You throw away the outside, you eat the inside. Excuse me, you, you throw away the outside, you cook the inside, then you eat the outside and throw away the inside. Ear corn. Isn't that good? I like that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, here's a good one. All right. This is one because, uh, yeah, you're like, should have known that. Should have known that, right? 
That's what you're gonna say when you're 35, all right? And you got scars and your lungs are nasty. You go, I should have known that because somebody told you the answer to the riddle. It seems so obvious, doesn't it? Once you know the answer to a riddle, that's why you murmur. It seems so stinking obvious. Like, look, man, all of us, you ever watch that spelling bee? On those kids that get those, those words right and then all the word words and all that different stuff. I mean, I, there's one, somebody asked me this one time, I was stumped. They go, hey, what word, I guarantee you, what word in the English language is always spelled incorrectly? Incorrectly. That's exactly right. All right. It's always spelled that way. Every time, even those kids in the spelling bee, they spell it incorrectly. I love riddles. All right. Let me tell you something. Life is a riddle. And until somebody, until somebody gives you the answer, man, it's going to mess with you and jack you up. Now, I want you to watch where Proverbs goes next. Because the way you answer this this one question, like, why are you here? Where are you from? Who created you? Is there a creator? Is he good? How do I get the most out of life? Where is life really? How you answer that question is the most important thing about you. Look what Proverbs 1 goes on to say. Man, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That, that's even a riddle because you think, man, fear, I want to be scared of it. No, listen, here's what I'm going to tell you. If I do my job in the next few minutes, you'll have a proper fear of the Lord. And what I mean by that is you'll respect him, you'll know him for who he is, and you'll be somebody that goes, I don't want to miss another word that comes out of his mouth. If it is true that he is a sun and a shield, that he gives life and light, okay, Everybody else has just said, hey, we're trying to be brighter than the sun. That's what people have always done. I don't need God. I'll be my own God. God is a sun and a shield. He is a provider of life. He causes things to grow. He gives light and direction, and he is a protector. He gives, watch this, grace and glory. When you think about God, this is Psalm 84, 11. When you think about God, what do you think of? If you don't think about God as a gift giver, that he gives you stuff you don't deserve, that's grace. And he gives you, watch this, glory, not momentary beauty that youth promises will please you forever. No, it fades. God gives you glory. I tell my little girls, man, you pursue true beauty. Bodies deteriorate. Persons develop. God wants to make you glorious and beautiful so that others look at you not just in your 20s, in your best times, he wants people to look at you for decades and just go, that is a life, that is a man. If we multiplied that kind of human, this would be a better place. Not if I could get that human to do what I want to do for a second, it would give me pleasure. But God just says, hey man, I want to give you life. I want you to be a life giver to others. I don't want you to, to seek pleasure from other people. I want you to find the pleasure that is in me. And you are, when you become convinced that that's who God is, that he's not looking to rip you off, but looking to set you free, you're gonna be like this every time he speaks. Tell me more of God. What's he give? He's given more grace, more glory. I want more of that. Watch this. The next verse in Psalm 84 says this. No good thing does he withhold from those who love him. What's the bad advice tonight? The bad advice tonight is get it while you can. Treat yourself. Go get what the world has to offer. I'm telling you, the world is lying to you. The song's always been sung. From Homer's time to my time in the 70s to your time in the teens. And there's always been a loving father who wants to say this to you. Watch this. Hear my son, my daughter, your father's instruction. This is verse eight. Do not forsake your mother's teaching. Indeed, they are graceful, watch this, a graceful wreath to your head and ornaments about your neck. My son, if sinners entice you, and they will, their songs are everywhere, do not consent. Now watch this. Tell me, see if, if your father in heaven understands the siren songs you hear. I, I hear them all the time. If they say, come with us, let us lie and wait for blood. Let us ambush the innocent without cause. Let us swallow them alive like Sheol, even whole as those who ground to the pit. We will find all kinds of precious wealth. We will fill our houses with spoil. Throw in your lot with us. We shall all have one purse. <laughs> right? Just, I, I, whenever I read that, I, I read it with that kind of build. And it's like, I, I see a pirate. He's like, let's go rape the women. Let's go get the booty, right? 
pirate's booty. And, and let's, <laughs> let's, you know, and let's, let's go. And I, I read that, and I'm like, yeah, man, that looks like the ship to sail with. Those guys don't have to really work. Everybody thinks they're cool. They make movies about them. Everybody wants to be Johnny Depp. And you're like, gosh, you know, should I go? Right? Every time I read that, I get that. Let me just, just for a second, let me just take you over and, and leave this metaphor for a second. Let me show you an amazing section of scripture here in, in Proverbs chapter seven. Watch, this one's a little bit more seductive. It uses seductive language. I mean, you read this, you're almost like, gosh, I'm not even sure I should read this. First of all, we'll set it up. Proverbs seven, verses one through four. My son, keep my words. Think of a pleading father who loves you, who's not trying to rip you off. He's trying to keep you from that disease, from that being used for a moment and discarded. Treasure what I'm saying to you. Keep my commandments and live. And my teaching is the apple of your eye at the center of your thought. Bind them on your fingers. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Say to wisdom, you are my sister. And call understanding your intimate friend. Why? Watch this. That wisdom and understanding will keep you from an adulteress from that beautiful, dark-skinned woman who flatters with her words. For at the window of my house, I looked out through my lattice. I see it happen every day. I saw among the naive and discerned among the youths a young man lacking sense. Passing through the street near her corner, he takes the way to her house. In the twilight, in the evening, it's getting dark. He can move in the shadows in the middle of the night. In the darkness, behold, here she comes. A woman comes to meet him, dressed as a harlot, beautiful, silky, cunning of heart. She is boisterous, rebellious, seductive. Her feet do not remain at home. She is now in the streets, now in the square. She lurks by every corner. She seizes him and kisses him. With a brazen face, she says to him, I was due to offer peace offerings today. That was my excuse to get out. Today I have paid my peace fast. Therefore, I've come out to meet you, to seek your presence earnestly. I love you. You're what I need. You can make me happy. I have found you. I have spread my couch with coverings, with colored linens of Egypt. I have sprinkled my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. This is kind of like, you know, Proverbs 7 porn is what this is. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And you watch this. Here it goes. Come, let us drink our fill of love until morning. Let us delight ourselves with caresses, for my husband is not home. He has gone on a long journey. He has taken a bag of money with him. At full moon, he will come home with her many persuasions. I guess she entices him. Come get it now. With her flattering lips, she seduces him. See, this is where most of us just kind of go to a blackout phase. And we get lost in the fantasy of how amazing it would be to be pursued by that, that beautiful woman. We've, we've, we've imagined her time after time. And each time we do, we, we, we have chemicals that fire in our brain that, that hardwire us to want her more. We put these images before us and we, we fantasize until finally we go out and we numb ourselves and drink so that we can be a little bit less discerning so that we can move towards her maybe in that bar and be as high as an empire building and then maybe we can just have a little bit of that light when God all the time is saying, I am your son, I am your shield. Listen to me, watch this. Look at what happens because I want to wake you up because this the story's not over when she arches her back. This is the truth. Suddenly he follows her. As an ox goes to the slaughter, or as one in fetters to the discipline of a fool. Until an arrow pierces through his liver. That is fatal. As a bird hastens to the snare. What kind of bird does that? So he does not know that it will cost him his life. Now therefore, my son, listen to me. Come up out of your little pornographic imaging about how pleasant it will be. Pay attention to the words of my mouth. Do not let your heart turn aside to her ways. Don't stray into her paths, for many are the victims she has cast down and numerous all her slain. Her house is the way to hell, descending to the chambers of death. Another proverb early on says, you will be reduced to a loaf of bread. He goes, he does not know that the dead are there. But she is seductive. Come treat yourself. Back to Proverbs 1 and the pirates. Look at this. 
Verse 15, my son, little interlude, do not walk in the way with them. Keep your feet from their path, for their feet run to evil. They hasten to shed blood. Indeed, it's as useless it's useless to spread the bait of net in the side of a bird. Birds have more sense. Bird brains, small brains, have the sense to not go near a net. People who go there, they lie in wait, who live like this, they lie in wait for their own blood. They ambush their own lives. They're ruining their own lives. I know it looks like they're having fun. I know the commercials say they're having fun. I know it looks like Vegas is having fun. But the dead are there. So are the ways of everyone who gains by violence. It takes away the life of its possessors. That's just a dad trying to, you know what the son said? Not dad, not, not me. It won't take my life. Let me just show you some pictures of some of your friends maybe that are out there. And this is, this is when they had a big night on the town and, and it didn't go exactly like they wanted, okay? Because they were busted. They were popped, okay? They went out there. They were bumming the folks. They come on, man, play with me. And, and, okay, they were some of the unlucky ones that had a little bit too much. They didn't have a designated driver, so they got arrested. So there's a little smirk. I'm 18. Yeah, you got me. All right? So tonight I'm a perp, but I'm going to party again. Let's keep reading. Verse 20, wisdom shouts in the streets. She lifts her voice in the square. At the head of the noisy street, she cries out, man. At the porch on Tuesday nights, she cries out. And at the entrance of the city gates, she utters her sayings. How long, oh naive ones, will you love being simple-minded? And scoffers delight themselves in scoffing, and fools hate knowledge. Turn to my reproof. This is what we're doing here tonight. Turn to the reproof. Behold, I will pour out my spirit on you. I'm not mad at you, sweetie. I'm not mad at you, son. I just don't want you to give yourself to the harlot, because I know where that will lead. Come. And, 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 and by the way, expand this, expand this well beyond just physical intimacy with somebody who's not your spouse. This is any error. It is any voice that says, God doesn't have your best interest in mind. Come on, man, you don't need that old time religion. No, you don't need old time religion. You need the ancient of days who is a loving father who wants to make all your ways peace, who wants to train you up in godliness so that guilt and shame and sorrow will not define your life. He wants to be a blessing to you. So God is. He's kind. Listen to what it says. How long will you love being simple-minded, scoffers delight? Turn to my reproof. I'll pour out my spirit on you. Verse 24, because I called, watch this, and you refused. Because I stretched out my hand and no one paid attention. Because you kept sowing. And because you didn't reap, the hearts of men among you were given fully to do evil. This is what it says. You neglected all my counsel. You didn't want my reproof. Listen, this is Proverbs 1. This is God just telling you. This is the way it's going to be. I'm not mad at you. You're free to make your own choices, but you're not free to choose your consequences. This is the law of the harvest. You reap what you sow. You reap more than you sowed, and you reap it later than you sowed it. There's a reason that you put that seed of evil in your life, and right away it doesn't grow poison. Because it takes a while for it to germinate and die. And then eventually it gets roots and then it bursts up through the soil and all of a sudden it overtakes your house and you're living underneath its shade and it's feeding you things that are bitter. It takes time. You put one seed in the ground, it grows a whole plant of trouble. And God's just saying, listen, I tried to spare you from that. Watch this. You neglected my counsel, verse 25. You didn't want my reproof. Now this is wisdom talking, not God. I will laugh at your calamity. I will mock at you when your dread comes. When your dread comes like a storm and your calamity comes like a whirlwind, when distress and anguish come upon you, and they will, then you will finally call on me on wisdom, but I will not answer. They will seek me diligently, but they will not find me. You're going to be trapped. Watch this, because they hated knowledge, because they bought the lie, they took the bad advice. This is recess. I can grow up later. Because they hated knowledge and did not choose to listen tenderly to a loving father who wanted to protect them. They would not accept my counsel. They spurned all my reproof. Watch this. So they shall eat of the fruit of their own way and be satiated with their own devices. For the waywardness of the naive will kill them and the complacencies of fools will destroy them. Do you see that, guys? You've got to begin with the end in mind. It is a habit of highly successful people. That's habit number one. You've got to begin with the end in mind. And you know what youth do? The youth go, I'll worry about the end later. That is why it says, 
by the same author in another book, it is better go to the house of mourning, Ecclesiastes 7.2, than it is to the house of feasting. Because that is the end of every man, and the living take it to heart. It's why it says in verse four, the mind of the wise is in the house of mourning, while the mind of fools is in the house of pleasure. It's better to listen to the rebuke of a wise man than for one to listen to the song of fools. So you get to decide, man. You get to decide what the ingredients are that you put into the, into the, into the mixing bowl of your life. And God's not mad at you. Here's the thing. Wisdom will mock you. But your heavenly father is right here tonight. He's just saying, just stop. Just stop. We, we, I am a God who makes all things new. But you've got to stop throwing those things into the bowl of your life and wondering why you're miserable. You've got to stop asking me why the cake of your existence tastes this way. You've got to quit saying to me, why did I do this to you? I didn't do this to you. I gave you a recipe card that was going to make life pleasant. This is Proverbs 22.4. Proverbs 22.4, one of the most amazing proverbs in all of the scripture. The reward of humility and the fear of the Lord are, watch, riches, honor, and life. See, what's the enemy told you, man? There's no life over there? You've got you to listen. It's just the opposite. You know what some bad advice is? Go get you some. You know what some great advice is? Go get all of God you can while you're young. Get him now. While you still can enjoy it. Oh, remember our friends that were trying to get us to go party? I know they got rung up and busted. Okay, they got out of jail. They went out and they partied some more. Well, the second time they got arrested, this is what one of them looked like. It goes on from there. Another one of our buddies, she got arrested again, or he got arrested again. This is the second time he got busted. He was a three-time loser. This is what he looks like now. Oh, yeah, there was another friend. We had a bunch of them. That was her, and now she's that. She's probably out there tricking to get some of what she needs. Our sweet friend at 32, 37, now 38 was a rough year. Then we had this dear friend. Life got harder and harder for her. Wisdom mocked her. And then there's one more. This sweet thing, between the first arrest and second arrest, was free basin, got a little burned up, but that didn't stop her because she was addicted and the synapses were there and she had to go back and got busted again after she experienced the horrors of going her way. Listen, you guys got to begin with the end in mind. I'm just telling you. What you do is you always study the stories that are the exception to the rule. But you know why they're an exception to the rule? Because there is a rule. And there's a father up there who's just saying, look, I love you enough to tell you. I don't want your destiny to be guilt and shame. I want it to be riches, honor, and life. And the sooner you can get to it, the better it's going to be for you. This is what the guy who wrote that book said at the very end of his life. And it's one of my favorite places to go. I, 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 you know, we already read in Ecclesiastes. I'm going to go down to chapter 12. But in Ecclesiastes chapter 7 it says, better go to the house of mourning than the house of feasting because it's the end of every man. I, 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 I'm telling you guys, you ought to go and you ought to listen to people when they talk about what life was about. When lives come to an end, you want to sit and go, what do I want my life to have been? Man, that guy was a party. Or do you want it to be that person was a source of good to me? And they kept me from destruction and sorrow. They were kind to me and they modeled for me a better way. They showed me that there was a better song to listen to. They, when everybody else was singing the songs of fool, they lived a life of faith. And I saw the blessing in this person's life. Do you know what the whole book of Ecclesiastes is about? The entire thing is about a guy trying to find life everywhere that he can. And at the end of his life, when he's tried everything, and I, I, the way I can describe the book of Ecclesiastes is this way. Solomon was the only guy that ran out of mirages before he ran out of money. What do I mean? Mirages are appearances that there's life somewhere because of a hallucination, because of um, the way light will play with you in certain heated environments where you think that there's going to be some, some source of life up here, and the closer you get to it, you realize it was a mirage. It's not really there. Solomon chased wine, women, song, power, fame, position. He got it all, and after he chased every single mirage there was, he still had everything he needed. He ran the experiment for you. He lived it, and now he's going to say, having gone everywhere 
to try and find life, I'm going back at the end of my life where I was when I started at the beginning when my father told me that the Lord God is a sun and shield. This is the very end of his life. This is the last words of a dying man. This is the house of mourning. This is what he says. Are you ready? Let's tune in. He says, remember the creator, watch this, in the days of your youth. It's not have recess. Because recess is no fun when you don't live the way you should live. You come back with scars and scabs and sorrow and you live with bullies. And you're isolated and you're alone. He's saying life is right here with your teacher and your master and your God. He's a good God. Use the days of your youth before the evil days come and the years draw near when you will say, I have no delight in them. This is the truth. I'm gonna just tell you, there's, there's, there's all kinds of people that are gonna have recess, 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 divorce, affair, addiction, and they're gonna make it through and late in their life, they're gonna to come to a moment where they go, this was crazy. And someone's gonna talk about the grace of God and they're gonna take it. And I believe if they genuinely take it, I think they'll be saved. I think much of their life will be wasted. But here's what you need to know. You, you have no idea how many of us in this room are gonna make it to be three score or more. God offers forgiveness to your repentance. He does not promise tomorrow to your procrastination. I today stood next to a hole that I put a 17-year-old in today. And I have no idea where, where your hole is gonna come, but it doesn't matter about where your hole's gonna come. You gotta decide, when are you gonna grab life? When are you gonna want what God wants for you? He's not trying to rip you off. He's trying to set you free. I'm gonna tell you, by the grace of God, I am one of those strange people that when only the good die young was on, somebody said, let me just tell you, that's a lie. The good don't die young. People who die to themselves experience life. And I started to listen. And so from about 1979 on, man, I have been testing this book to see if it is true. And I'm here to tell you, some 40 years later almost, that there has never been a time when I have listened to a loving father who is a son and shield, who gives grace and glory, who no good thing he, does he deny those who love him. There's not been a single time I've listened to him that I've regretted it. I've missed out on some incredible, enticing opportunities. I have missed out on the seductive words of foreign women. I've been in those environments. I have missed out on numbing myself in the face of pain. But you know what else I've done? I've grown to be a man. Do you know what happens, by the way, if you learn to numb your pain with um, meds or with alcohol? Here's what happens. You don't grow. You don't become the full measure of a person you should be. You stunt your maturity because instead of growing up and persevering and becoming the man that God intended to be, you stay stuck as a 17-year-old. You stay stuck as a 22-year-old, and you never grow through it because every time there's pain, you run and put the pacifier of medication in your life. And that is why you see so many immature 30-year-olds and 40-year-olds because they never grew beyond the moment they became addicted. Every time I feel sad, every time I feel lonely, every time I feel uh, isolated, I go and I just click on that button, I watch a movie, and I imagine myself I'm in there. Instead of learning to be a man, I just keep laying down pathways to what I think is pleasure, but it's not real pleasure. You stunt your growth and you stunt your development and you never grow to be the glorious person that God wants you to be. Don't go intoxicate yourself. That's what the scripture says. It says, don't be drunk with wine, for that is dissipation. It stunts your growth. It makes you less than the man or woman you're supposed to be. But instead, be filled with the Spirit. And when you're filled with the Spirit, what's going to happen is there's going to be more love and goodness and gentleness and kindness and faithfulness and self-control. There's going to be a measure of a man and a godly woman that people are going to look at and go, who are you? Who's your daddy? And you get to say, by the grace of God, i got to tell you, by the grace of God, it's the kindness of God. And I still have a hard time listening to my dad, but he has forgiven me, and I, I'm learning to fear him. And what you're seeing in me that is beautiful is because I've been tutored underneath his kindness. Look, guys. Look what it says. This is Solomon. Let's just read it real quickly, and we're done. He just says this. He goes, draw near to God. God, he's, God is the God of the young. Can I just say this to you real quick? 
Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then it goes on through and it talks. Everybody thinks it's a great psalm to read next to people who are on their deathbed. Psalm 23 is not written for old men on their deathbed. It is written for young shepherd boys who are facing bears and lions and giants. Psalm 23 is a psalm of a 20-year-old. And you gotta figure out, man, God is here to shepherd me through this time when, when all my insecurities and all my wonders and all my, all my hormones are just firing and all my opportunities before me. And instead of wasting it and squandering it on a loose living, Psalm 23 is saying, come here, man, I'm gonna walk you through the valley of the shadow of death. When everybody else goes to, to play and they train themselves to die, I'm gonna train you to be a great daddy, a great mama. I'm gonna train you to have a successful marriage. I'm gonna train you how to be a glory to God and to your community. I'm gonna train you how to be a selfless leader, a warrior. That's Psalm 23. And God is calling you in. It's not there to read when you're on your deathbed. It's there to read when you are starting your life. And Solomon wants you to know it. He says this, don't wait till you're dead. Don't wait till you're weak. Before the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are dark. And what he's saying, before there's diminished light and hope and there's no hope for tomorrow and the clouds return after the rain. In other words, you're increasingly gloomy because you realize life is about to be over. Don't wait to meet God then. He's a God of the young. In the day that the watchmen of the house tremble, that's the arms and the hands, they kind of watch the house like this and they're weak and you're old and you tremble. Don't wait till the mighty men stoop. That's, that's, these are the mighty men. That's what he's talking about right here. Don't wait till they're weak. The grinding ones stand idle because there are few. It's talking about, you know, it's talking about your teeth. There's not many of them. By the way, you want a riddle? I'll throw out a riddle for you. How do you know that the toothbrush was invented in Kentucky? Because if it was invented anywhere else, it'd be called the teeth brush. That's why. All right? No, okay. All right, back to here. All right, no, come on. If this is broadcast to Kentucky, just pretend I said Arkansas. And here we go. All right, here we go. Come on, watch. Solomon saying, don't wait till you lose your teeth, all right? Watch. He goes on to say, when, when, the, when, when those who look through the windows grow dim, he's talking about your eyes in a very poetic way, and the doors in the street are shut. That's, that's the street of, of life. The lips are shut because you're like this, and the grinding mill is low. Your appetite is going away, and no one will rise, uh, and, and one will arise at the sound of the bird early in the morning. Sleep is fleeting. The daughters of the song will sing softly. You can't hear anything. Furthermore, at that point in life, men are afraid of high places. You have a loss of vigor and tears on the road. The almond tree blossoms, your hair gets white, the grasshopper drags himself along, the back is hunched over, the caper berry is ineffective. Viagra. For a man goes to his eternal home, while mourners go to the street. Remember before the silver cord is broken, the cord of life, the spinal cord, the golden bowl is crushed, the pitcher by the well is shattered, the wheel of the sister and the heart is not moving like it should, and the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. Oh, vanity, how foolish to live your life apart from a God who wants you to have lived those last 60 years that now as you're sitting there scared, he wants those 60 years to look back on them and go, man, I was useful, I was loving, I was chaste, I was powerful, I wasn't a victim to dogs and liars. I tied myself to the master truth, and I did not wreck my ship and everybody that was on it with me. Don't you want that life? Then quit listening to the bad advice to treat yourself. And you learn to come after the one who loves you. Folks, that's some good advice. I'm here to tell you, I haven't done it perfectly, but every time I've done it, every time I've done it, it's been a blessing. I, I say it almost every time I'm here. First John 5, 3. This is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. Hey guys, I'm gonna tell you, man, there's always a backlash out there. There's always a moment you wake up and you sober up and you look over and you go, oh my gosh, there's always an unwanted something you're dealing with. When you walk with God, all your ways are peace. It doesn't mean there's not gonna be trouble, but he's gonna say, hey, listen, you're going to have peace in the midst of trouble because you understand why there's trouble in the world because people don't tie themselves to the mast of truth. And you're going to run into some of them and they're going to be cruel to you and mean to you. I'm going to tell you not to yoke with them. I'm going to tell them not to make them your, your companions, but be a friend to them. Friends love at all times. Friends treat them as individuals, not as projects. And friends speak the truth. You be a friend to those people. But you let me be your companion. 
So you want some good advice? Get God while you can, not it. Not some impersonal pronoun that wants to waste you on it. You get the lover who gives grace and glory. You get God while you can, wherever you can, and you get all you can. You'll never be sated. You'll never loathe him. You'll learn to love him more and more. The beauty of walking with God is the longer you do it, the more you see the sweetness of his way. Some of you guys are seeing the bitterness of the other way. That's because you're serving a liar. And you're not gonna find anybody in this room that's been walking along with God that go, he gets more and more bitter. They're gonna go, he gets more and more sweet. And my life gets more and more full of riches and honor in life. And I'm ready for this life to end because it'll get sweeter still. Where the rest of you're hoping you can hang on. And that this bitterness that you're in, that this hell on earth will continue because if you're not walking with God, you need to know something. This is your heaven. So you get all the glory and fun and intoxication you can because it's never going to get better than this. If you know God and you're walking with him on this earth that isn't as it should be, this is your hell. It's only going to get better. And while it's here, it's going to get better because he's going to give you purpose and meaning in life. Do you want some of that? Get all the God you can, wherever you can, as much as you can. That's some good advice. Father, I pray for my friends that they'd believe it, that they'd know it, they'd see it as true. And Lord, I am sure there's some people in this room that right now are hearing from an enemy who wants to lie to them and tell them that maybe because they've listened to liars too long that you wouldn't want them. And I pray that they would see you for the kind God that you are. I pray that they would see you as the lover that you are, that you're, your toes are at the end of the ranch and you want to run to them. And all it takes is them just saying, but Lord, I have squandered my life on my life on, on loose living and wine and women or whatever it is. I've been that woman. I've been that, that man that's tried to find life apart from you and I am sick and tired of being sick and tired. And Lord, when they come to you, I know they're gonna find grace and forgiveness. I know you say you're the God who even though their sins are red as scarlet will make them white as snow. I know that you say that you'll restore the years the locusts have eaten. We thank you, Father, that you can even relay tracks. You can help our mind not to be conformed to the world, but you can transform us. You can bring healing to our mind. It's gonna take some diligence. It's gonna take some work. But we can start to be people that listen to you and by grace are restored. And by faith, we seek you because we know that you're good. And we reject the bad advice that your word's not true, that you don't have our best interests in mind and that disobeying you is not that big a deal. And we run to you, and we fear that we would miss another word because we see your goodness. Father, I pray that that story be multiplied in this room and other rooms like this across the country time and time and time again, that we wouldn't stunt our growth and maturity by numbing ourselves with fleeting moments of irresponsibility, but we'd be fully alive, fully awake, more deeply in love with you. Thank you, Father, that everybody in this room can come to Jesus, be forgiven, and grow, and be healed. To God be the glory. Man, that's what we do here at the porch. We bless his name. We're just telling you the truth. We, when you bless, you speak well. That's what the word means. We speak well of God's name. There's so many of us, gang, who have walked not just in the valley of the shadow of death. We have been death to ourselves. We've invited others into it. We've been those mockers. And while wisdom does laugh at you, wisdom is not God. Wisdom is God's, and that's why he's calling you and standing at the corner of the street saying, come, come. If you're going to dwell in the house of the Lord, you've got to come to it, and he is here. And the Father whose house you have left is ready to run to you. Some of you guys don't think you've walked through the valley of the shadow of death. Some of you guys are out there going, I'm dead, Todd. If you knew what I did... You wouldn't think that I could come. No, you need to know something. God, I don't care if you're wrapped in grave clothes. He can say to you, Lazarus, come out. He can call you right now tonight, and he's saying to you, come, be healed. Though your sins are red as scarlet, I can make them white as snow. You're not a lost cause. You're mine. You're lost. Come, find life in me. That's what Jesus says. That's what I have found. I have listened to the lies that only the good die young. You know you're dead. 
Will you let him breathe life into you? Those of you that know that there is life to be found, will you be a friend and will you be companions to one another as you walk through the valley of the shadow of your 20s? You're not to do it alone. You're to do it with other people who sing of the goodness and mercy of God, who remind you that he's kind. We know it's hard. In this world, you're gonna have trouble, but take heart, he has overcome this world and he can overcome your sin and the scars and the hard wiring. He can transform it, but you've gotta stop putting recipes of death in your bowl. He is the God of the young. He wants to shepherd you and rescue you. Will you come to him? There will be a team here and wherever you are to sit and visit with you. Would you come tonight and let us tell you about the goodness and mercy of our God? We love you, Porch. We love you people who are listening. Come and find life with us in the goodness of God. Have a great night. We'll see you.